What I really wanted to do, I think I want to focus on the actual fish part of it because I think we're all, everybody here is a fish geek in some way. Uh, we're all aquarists. Uh, I think we're professional aquarists. We're in the business. And I think that's important because we have to understand that uh, as aquarists, we have more empathy and curiosity of life and the life sciences than maybe an average person not in the pet business. And I think that's important because we have to spread our word and our information about these animals so that people take better care of them and connect with these animals. You know, they argue that our business can be um, detrimental against the coral reefs. But to the contrary, I believe we have long-lasting and very beneficial benefits to the reefs if we do it right through education and conservation. So what we learned today is really just going to be an abbreviation of different groupings of fish that I put together on the general care of how you might want to maintain them in your shop or in your facility. They aren't necessarily the same care that your customers would do at home. Make sense? That's, that's really where I'm going with this, and I kind of try to think of a methodical way of uh, putting these fish together in groups. Now maybe I won't have to worry about skipping the slides because I'm not moving through the slides. Just to uh, remind you that I will be talking about marine fish exotics, not coral. We're not going to really discuss coral today. And, um, I was going to have a little blurb on some of the things that uh, uh, people want. And you should care about marine exotics because we should all know that marine fish keepers are more likely to visit your store three times, more likely in a month with fresh water. They spend three to four times more in dollars at your shop because they need more things. They need calcium, magnesium, fish foods. So we can look at them as dollar opportunities but at the same time, they're not dollar opportunities if we don't know how to tell them how to care for them or we're not caring for them properly. <laughs> Who's retail again? Retail, so good, good amount. So you guys know, do you ever get customers and ask you to think marine aquariums are hard to keep? That's the general consensus. They don't say all marine aquariums are hard to keep. Try to change your staff into, you know, don't let them think that. Marine aquariums are not hard to keep. They're probably more time consuming and they cost more to set up. They're really not hard to keep. And what you should think about doing for your staff and your group is, Ask and figure out and put together a little miniature chart that will tell them how many hours a week should they contribute for this size of a reef tank and for this size of a marine tank. For example, 10 gallon reef, 10 gallon uh, fish, 30 gallon reef, 30 gallon fish, 75 and maybe 100. You have four different sizes. How many hours a week do they have to think about that you believe they have to be willing to dedicate to their aquarium. Because if they can't dedicate that time, their money is wasted. Because the aquarium will go downhill. So think about making a chart like that for your staff to use, because it's very beneficial before they spend the money on an aquarium that maybe they don't want to put in the time to take care of. We have that chart, and we also have a chart on the general cost that it costs them per month to maintain. You know, salt, calcium, uh, buffers, so it's a general cost. So if you work out two little charts on just four general sizes, really makes things better for your service and your client. Can you still hear me? Yes? Anybody want flyers? How about if I hand them back? How are you? Well, nice to see you. Why don't I give you the flyers? 
I just talked about marine aquariums are sustainable and can be good for marine ecosystems. Think about this. Any one of us that have taken biology, chemistry, or physics, we are somewhat, in high school, we are somewhat familiar with the terms of pH, KH, and salinity. And some of us went to college and we studied in the life sciences. So we became familiar with some of the phyla and taxonomy that we use today. Think about your staff. How much more relevant and meaningful is it now with their care of these organisms? It's a wonderful, blessed situation that we've been, uh, that we are in. And it's something you want your staff to understand that. But again, that you want to teach your staff to brand our industry and that you have to connect with the fish and their environment. And you can't connect with the fish if we're not keeping them well. You have to keep the fish well. Nobody wants to see dead fish. Not just from the money aspect, it's very stressful. And we've dealt with those customers, haven't we? We both dealt with them. It goes beyond money. And you're dealing with them. And the one thing I've always learned, I was twisted out of the bit, out of the money aspect, and think about these organisms that might be perishing, and then try to get them on a straight path. There are three different types of marine systems, and they generally require different strategies. There's a fish-only system. If you have fish-only systems in your shop, you generally <laughs> should have decorative coral in it, rock, inner rock, with a large uh, bioball system, sand filter system, a biological filter system. Usually they're uv for irradiation, uh, and they're well skimmed. They're will somewhat be different from maybe a fowler system, which is fish-only with live rock. Some stores have that. They like to use the live rock as their biological filter. I believe in a commercial setting, you should be heavily UV in a fowler system because you don't really have the opportunity to use some of the chemical medications. And unfortunately, part of our game is that fish do get sick through transit. So it would serve you best if you are going to display in a fowler system to be heavily UV. And then, of course, we have reef systems. The reef systems should usually not connect with the fish systems. The reef systems should not connect with your live rock. Your live rock is the pure, it's dirty, it's going to produce quite a bit of organic phosphates and organic carbons. And these organic phosphates and carbons will usually make your reef systems look very dirty by producing quite a bit of cyano. It's hard enough to keep cyano out of our reef system. I don't recommend connecting it with your live rock, your lock, your new syllable live rock. Your reef system should have pure rock that you don't sell because you need the system to look right for your coral. You shouldn't be selling fish out of your reef systems if you can help it. They damage the coral by, if, unless you have very good catcher. What, what, what amazes me is how many shops i noticed have just uh, Rated uh, or, or um, perforated grates as a reef system. And I said, wow, what happened to displaying your coral and on live rock? Because isn't that what your customers are buying? Shouldn't they be able to look at kind of what it looks like when it goes home? We all have frag systems where we got the frags in the uh, grates. I have it too. But you should also have another system that shows people what other colonies look like where it's on live rock. You should definitely do that. I noticed a lot of shops that don't do that anymore. Where's the inspiration? I, I don't get it. You can't inspire people to want to go out and do that. So I'm going to break these down. The first set of group I want to talk about are simple nano. These are the easy fish. These are fish that you can generally uh, use for starter fish with people, small tanks. You can keep these in, um, you know, the, people like to use the uh, bar system. They uh, aren't usually heavily skimmed. They're not heavily UV. 
feed or you feed at all, and these are fish that are less likely to be compromised in those kind of settings. The real hardy ones, easy to feed, you can raise these or keep these fish on a good dry food diet, something that has all 23 amino acids balanced properly, because if you don't know, fish need 23 amino acids. That's what they need. And they should be balanced properly. Uh, there are 10 indispensable amino acids they have to get in their diet. So a good dry food will have those things. First set of group is the palma centrist, which are the damsel fish. I love yellowtail blue damsels. Uh, I love to use them in my shop to keep one tank nice and full. They're very hardy and do well. If you notice, I'm not including the chromos here. I don't call those simple nano. They're more of a specialized nano fish. We've all been through the green chromis and blue ring chromis. Yeah, they lost a few of those in their time. Oh wait, somebody say, no, never, never did. I'm like, oh yeah, come on. Uh, they're specialized. Well, they do much better than they did, but but you know, they're not the same as like a yellow cup blue nano. I love uh, using the damsels. Of course, we know we have the bigger damsels like dominoes and the humbugs, they get a little more aggressive. The grama group is a really a strong, hardy group. Great little fish to keep, to put in nano tanks. And we have the royal grama, which is a Caribbean fish with the black cap basslet. If you want to sell something that's a little pricier, but really has that nice hardiness to it, that's a great fish to stock. I highly recommend it. We sell quite a bit of those. Um, the black caps are deeper water, and that's why they mainly cost for their Royal Brahma. I love chalk basslets. They're another Caribbean fish. Uh, they're not Brahmins. They're not in the same family as Brahmidae. They're actually in the grouper family, Ceramidae, but they're very similar to Brahmins. They stay small, very hardy little fish. Love these fish for beginner fish and animals. And I couldn't do this without my favorite, the Swiss Guard Basslet. I love the, uh, the, the counter to this is the Swalesi Basslet, which is the Indo-Pacific version. These are cave basslets, and they are pricey. Really hardy, but they're cryptic. Very cryptic fish. But it's a great fish to keep in your smaller uh, aquariums and sell them as really hardy little nano fish. Pseudochromids. We have the pseudo free body which is different than the purple pseudo. The purple pseudo, how you can tell, teacher staff this please, the dorsal and ventral fins are clear on a purple pseudo, and if you look at the free body, the purple goes all the way through, and it has a black bar right behind the eye. Anybody uh, ever see a, see a pseudo free body race? Are they gorgeous or what? And they, they stay purple, straight, and they're aquaculture now. Why don't we want to sell sustainable aquaculture fish? We all should. Purple pseudos are not aquaculture. Has anybody seen one of these things? When you, somebody keeps them, you ever got one of these back? They're pink and they're hunched. They really change. I mean, the, the whole fish turns pinkish, and, and if you ever notice, they always have a bent back to them. It's such a better bargain to sell them the aquaculture free monies or any of the Red Sea pseudos. The pseudo detoidi is another aquaculture pseudo, uh, pseudo springeri, pseudo uh, elongatus. These are all being aquacultured now, and these are all originally Red Sea fish that are now coming out of wherever Florida or Tennessee or anywhere where aquaculture is. Recommend them. Uh, not a pseudo, but a uh, marine bettis. Marine bettis are very hardy, strong fish. I knew customers that would give a year guarantee on them. Really strong fish. You just got to be careful. Don't keep these with tanks and your marine angels. Then it kind of looks like a crown tail marine bettis. We've done that many a time. So you got to make sure they're very docile fish. I like the blennies, but more like the, uh, not, not the fork tail blennies, but the little tiny blennies, like a, a teardrop blennie is a really good, strong, uh, simple nano fish. Of course, you should know that we are doing Bangai Kunderai gardens now. These are aquaculture. They do really well. They can breed with people. Very hard, strong, simple nano fish. 
and uh, the dark gobies. The only thing I can say about dark gobies, uh, micro desmidae, is that they jump. So you do have to make sure that you warn your clients on the fact that they do jump. I like it for small nanotanks, but the small nanotank has to be covered well. Uh, if it's not covered well, they tend to be on the floor. There's three types of fire fish, the purple, the red, and the Halfrishi, which is the Halfrishi is the one that's very pricey. Anybody ever have these? Yeah, they're, they're pricier, but they're really a sharp little fish that you can uh, make a higher margin on, but a really strong, hardy nano fish. Cardinals, like pajama cardinals. You guys use pajamas to fill the tanks? These simple nano fish are the ones you should use to keep your tanks cool, because they don't take as much work. And your clients will come in and see filled tanks. These are the easy ones. The forgotten put trampies, right? You think it's a hawk. Some people will call a trampies a hawk fish. It's not a hawk. It's actually a perchlet. It's in the Anthias family, uh, well, or the, uh, the grouper family. These are awesome little nano reef fish. They don't jump. They get along with each other. You can keep them together. Feed them a little bit of mysa shrimp or uh, some uh, spirulina brine or if you like copepods or any of these arctic pods and watch these babies just brighten up. Bright, bright red colors and they're real docile local fish. We push Plantrapheus a lot. To show you, I got really amped up about this really expensive Plantrapheus and I just had to get it. The reason why I bought it was because we had so much success for the little ones that I decided I'm going for the big one here. And I bought that one uh, about a month or two ago. That's a new slide that grew in there. That's a $1,500 fish retail. That was 1500 bucks. We still have it. I haven't sold it yet. Two months from now, you can call me up and I'll be crying. Oh, it died. It died. Yes, a pixie hawk and a geometric hawk, the same fish. Uh, Pixie hawk, you didn't know. No, sometimes they're calling this the geometric hawk. Yeah. Be careful because that's not a hawk. Right. That's not a hawk. Now, what I was going to show you here because you're just talking about it, I wanted to point out that if you notice, here's some hawkfish. The Pixie hawk is a hawkfish. Serhinidae. Different family. Hawkfish, if you notice, I didn't put in a simple nano group. Because I really don't think they're really equipped to be in nano tanks. I think they should be in something like 55s or larger. So, but the Plectranthias definitely can go in with nano tank. They don't get as large. Uh, the best hawks I like for the reefs, if I'm going to do them, are the Londos or the Flame Hawk, but I do like the uh, Falco Hawk or the Pixie Hawks as well. Uh, another one is that another forgotten hawkfish. You guys know the Caribbean Pinnos hawk? It's, it's, a, it's a freckled hawk, gray bars, it comes to the Caribbean. Bill, I bet you know, I bet you know what I'm talking about. It, it's a uh, Pinnos, and they only get like this big. Cute little hawkfish, they're very inexpensive. Uh, it's a really hardy fish. Problem with hawkfish, though, we have to remember is that some of the large versions are like group birds. So they will go after our ornamental shrimp. Peppermint shrimp, cleaner shrimp, and blood shrimp. So I don't really, you know, I need to consider them simple now. But they are different. I love selling clownfish. I love selling the wild clowns. I, I know the, the big rage is on all these um, uh, special clowns and the uh, designer clowns, as they call them. But I, I'm a fan, so in our shop, you'll see probably more different versions of wild type clowns. All most aquaculture. Uh, that's a Latezinatus, that's a McCulloch, Clarkies. Uh, hey, I'm curious, is this a cinnamon or a tomato? Anybody know? Go ahead, what? Yeah, that's what everybody thinks. It's not. It's a, it's a tomato. You know how you know the difference between tomato and cinnamon? Don't look for the black bar. Look at the pectoral fins, a pelvic fin. If it's a solid orange pelvic fin, it's Granatus, which is a tomato. If it's black, it's a Melanophis, which is cinnamon. But it, uh, teach your snap, that's a cool little fact to teach your snap. But, that, but you know, of, of even tomatoes will get that big black uh, on the back. So that actually is a tomato one right there. But either way, they're, they're great uh, clownfish. 
Uh, do you guys recommend intermingle the clownfish to keep them separate? I hope. Do you recommend your clients if they buy one species per tank? You should. If you don't, uh, I'm a, not a fan of trying to mix maroons with cinnamons and maroons and with uh, oscillaires. I don't even mix perch with oscillaires. So we keep a young, you know, stick to a clown species, keep them separate. Maybe in an enormous tank situation, you got a little leeway there, but I think it's wise to keep them separate. I try to keep a uh, uh, single clown in, in nano, the nano tanks. Right? Single clown, unless you have an established breeding pair. Is that? No, that's right. I agree. I agree with that. I, I, I think that's right up there in the same thing. And you know, there are certain clowns like maroons. It's very difficult to pair anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's really, unless you're buying a pair, it's very difficult. It's not like Ocellaris or Nemo. We can buy a big one, buy a smaller one, and you can set them up with it, and they can pick you know, a large or small out of the batch. But maroons, I mean, even the babies, they tear each other up. They just really go after each other. And we don't even try it. We always sell them with maroons to one, one per tank. Let's move on to specialized animals. Now, what these fish are like, these are smaller fish, but these fish don't live as easily as the last group. They usually need specialized diets. I think the biggest thing with specialized nano is they transport, and they are generally, generally weakened through transportation. So you have the same attitude with like the green chromas here, where you can buy, and your customers will buy uh, six green chromas because they want a swollen batch, and they lose them. And they come in and they're like, oh, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And where are I going? Oh, I don't know if you're doing anything wrong. You know, uh, these fish just go through a tremendous amount of stress through transit. And for some reason, we haven't tended to get uh, through that. But we will soon. I'm going to show you something in a minute that's going to show you, I'll tell you a story about a fish that I remember. We killed them all. And now, now if you kill them, you'll look down upon them. I'll show you what it is in a minute. So we'll get by that. Uh, watch the go, because I flip-flopped on this one. I almost put this one in the simple nano, but I was like, hey, I got enough slides in the simple nano. So I put it in specialized nano. I actually like watching the a lot with deep sand beds, because they actually will put a hole in there. We can pair them with pistol shrimp. Are you guys into the pistol shrimp? Watch the go thing? You gotta be into that. That's the new rage. You gotta have some pistol shrimp and watch these pair together. You know, make nice little burrows. I like it way better than sleepers because sleepers are sand sifters. Uh, we should all know that uh, it's a struggle to keep those things over a year, right? You guys, said, if I disagree with me, gold headed sleepers, orange diamonds. I would much rather see my clients buy a little watch for gold. We sell a little variety of cheap ones. Now it's actually a more expensive one to Dracula, but we do sell uh, cheap ones as well. Oh, Pistol Nathans are your uh, jawfish. Uh, I, who's bought a jaw? Really hardy fish, it's expensive, it's real hardy. The biggest thing with jawfish is deep tanks, 55 at least that depth because they're going to go out. Deep sand beds are very helpful with uh, usually live rock. Deep sand beds are generally helpful for all of these fish. The uh, dragonettes and the calium in it. Do you guys still price these things scooter blendies? We might do that. Shame on you. <laughs> they're, they're actually not blendies, they're dragonettes. They're actually related to mandarins. And uh, they're harder, a little harder than mandarins. There's the red dragonette, there's the brown dragonette. Uh, and yeah, I guess you want your people to understand they aren't blendies maybe because people have this myth that blendies eat algae. These things pick in microalgae, but they're really more of an omnivorous fish. They eat small crustaceans as well as uh, microalgae and sponge that are on live rock. But they're actually not blendies if you didn't know that. They're actually dragonettes. Um, some of the amphibians get large, but uh, some of the smaller amphibians like Bartlett's, I call them a specialized nano because they need to eat and they have to eat. I remember back in uh, the late 80s and the early 90s, we killed every amphibian that ever came into us. Uh, very difficult. Squam and Pendus and Bartlett's and uh, I could just go on and on and squarebacks. And nowadays, we do pretty well with amphibians. 
you know, do you guys do okay with them? And I think the biggest change that I've seen is the evolution of food sales. Because back in those days, you know, what do we have? We have brine shrimp and uh, a live brine shrimp. We didn't even have frozen mice shrimp back then. Remember that? There's no such thing. We have brine shrimp. Now we have this high protein source mice shrimp. We have arctic pods and gopa pods and uh, fish eggs, like roe. We eat fish eggs and roe. It's got a high omega fatty acid source and a high protein source. As you know from watching Discovery or Nature Channels, the ethnics are the, what are they? They're the minnows of the sea. They move and they need to have that energy source. That's what's going to keep them healthier. And that's why I think we do better with the ethnics today than we used to in the past. Should you feed the ethnics like Yes, I, I. You know what? I don't know if we made it to the end, but that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. I believe you should feed your fish in your shop three or four times a day, three times a day feeding. While we're on the subject, if I don't make it at the thought end, is flake them in the morning. Uh, use pellets with a vitamin C nutrient on your pellets in the morning. It stimulates the immune system, helps prevent lymphocytes. Because vitamin C, what it does for fish, it provides a biochemical pathway. Okay, it's called hexose monophosphate. And by doing that, it can now produce the right uh, NADPH, I think it's called, which is actually a way of the immune system of the white blood cells to ward off viruses and bacteria. It really helps with lymphocytes. Flake or dr uh, dry the vitamin C in the morning. During the day, a nice type of uh, refrigerated food. Maybe you like to do your algae feedings during the day. Uh, I love feeding during the day, and it's required in our shop. And we love to do the squirt balls going around because what do the clients see? What are you feeding? What's that? What's that? Well, it's right up here in the refrigerator. This is what we feed them. And then in the evening, they get their frozen variety choices. We do the frozen variety, but never feed on time of when you're open. Remember that, please. For us retailers, don't be before you open. Don't be that you close. Yeah? You want your clients to see what you be in the fish. That's part of this self marketing you sale. I got off subject. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. You know, I can keep in mind where I want to go anyway. But one of the other questions I had was somebody once told me that uh, Take your frozen cubes and put them in warm water first to bring up the so the, the temperature of the food is more similar. It's not you're not throwing in a frozen cube. No. You want to warm it dissolve. No. You, you, you know what you do? You, you get seawater out of your reef tanks or somewhere like that. You put the cubes in seawater. Okay. Just let them thaw in 78 degrees seawater. You want to keep the nutrients. The seawater will help retain the nutrients in the food. Especially with the reef jokes. Yeah. Uh, reef rasses, little reef rasses, like the carpenter rasses, filament rasses. Again, another fish that we never did real well with in the 80s and even through some of the 90s. But as you guys know, you guys do well with these fish. Um, Halicorys rasses, like the Melodurus rasses, most cousin is Christmas rasses. Christmas rasses is very similar. You'll just see more red lines down through the... Uh, uh, lateral part of the body. Now, a rasset is difficult as a macro perignodon of the leopard rasses. I remember when these were impossible, not really impossible anymore. Somebody once told me very recently, live blackworm seems to really be helpful. There's something in the blackworms that tends to keep their uh, gut microbes in check that they do better. I don't know that, but uh, something to think about if you want to try leopard grasses. This is not a hardy fish. This is not for beginners. Or if you have a compromised system. Yellow porous grasses, and as you know, these are not porous grasses. They're actually halicorious grasses. Specialized nano. So, um, over here I have a yellow-headed jawfish, and we buy these, and I buy these from 10 minutes. We buy these from numerous suppliers, and with the suppliers, we get good matches, and I get bad matches, and I try and throw this supplier, this supplier, this supplier, this supplier. It seems to be a hit and miss for me. Has anybody else experienced that with yellow? It's just like, you're just rolling the dice, 
and uh, we do that. The push I want to talk about is the old six line rack. How do you guys do a six line rack? Pretty good? Yeah, so do we. I remember we buy 20 of them and you hold one lift. Do you remember those days? Do you guys remember that? We buy 20 of them and you're like, oh, I can get one out of this um, So things have changed. I think we have better collecting now. I think that's changed. I think we do better nutritionally wise. So I do think there's hope that we'll have big promises. And in a few years from now, maybe five years from now, we'll look back at my presentation and say, that guy was goofy. We promise live like uh, they're hardy as uh, they're as hardy as a new uh, These things are great. So I hope we get to that level someday. Sometimes you have to remember that your wholesalers can't hold these fish for a long time, especially specialized nano fish. And I've heard people complain about a wholesaler. They don't quarantine enough, they don't hold them long enough. Well, when you take something like a mandarin or a dragonette, it's got to move through the chain a little bit quicker. I think angels and tanks should be quarantined and looked after and fed. But certain fish, we have to get them through to uh, a better TLC in the tank with live rock at the shop or in your customer's uh, or your client's home where they can start eating off the rock. Remember that quarantining isn't always best served. Examples of food that we feed our atheists and reprocess. Um, I got five minutes, so I'm probably going to move for the powerful exotics uh, really quick. Powerful exotics are your larger fish, because they're not big fish. They're easier to keep, they're less compromised in uh, your uh, smaller system. They're always ones that you sell to the fish customer with the big tank. Maybe they aren't UV or they are skim. And those are the triggers the large wrasses, the large hogs. Keep in mind that we do have breed safe hogs, like the Terra Labor's hog, and we have the uh, Barnack hog. Great little hogs that are hardy, they can go with little weight things. Uh, the Sepiacata hog, or known as the Masuda hog. Porcupine puffers. Every year I get one of my guys sells one to a reef thing. You ever had that one? That's like the worst reef fish ever. But, they eat everything. Flesh and coral eat everything. But they're great, uh, uh, strong, hearty fish. Uh, the uh, three tooth puffers, the lions, groupers, and of course the squirrel fish, the big eyes or the squirrel fish are all strong, hearty, powerful exotics. So I like the Riggins trigger, which are the Xanthicnes or the blue throat triggers, or probably the, some of your best triggers that you can put them in reefs. If you're going to sell a trigger to a reef. You can see, look at the size of the mount in the uh, pupil cavity there, as opposed to the larger mounts you see on the trigger. Most of these powerful exotics, like the eels and the uh, marathon puffers, they need to be in big tanks. 75, 90, 125 gallon tanks. When you display them in your shop, have seen shops that display these fish? Uh, where they'll have a six inch niger trigger in a, like a Mars cube. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm not sure I like that. I, I'm not a fan of those. I really hope that if you're displaying these bigger fish, you have a larger tank to display them in and you have the space for them. I know that's why we have a variety of tank sizes in our system to display the fish properly. This is lateral line disorder, which happens often on large fish. Lateral well, line disorder happens when the systems are dirty. Their lack of vacuuming, they don't clean the gravel bed often, they're under UV, they're under water changes. I've read a lot of material on LLD, and LLD is a, is a mystery to a lot of us. But if you ever notice, when you read through all this stuff, I've heard of carbon, the carbon floor gets inside the floors, affects the floors, and that's a bacterial infection that is uh, actually affecting the epithelial cells of the fish. But when you really boil it down, it's really just an immune function, you know? And what it is, is you, you just gotta do water changes, keep your systems clean, get the UV and skimming up. Tell your clients the same thing. You ever notice they happen in tanks where it's a 55, under filter, under UV? That's when you tend to see it on more tanks than not. 
and you see it in the systems. Anybody have a problem with that in their shop, LLD? Vitamin C or pellets every morning. We do it every morning. It's a great way to get rid of lymph systems. Five minutes, thank you. Give me 20. No, it's easy. Uh, so the supreme exotics are the ones that we always struggle with. These are the ones that we uh, get cryptocarrion or amandidium more than other fish. These are ones we find that are backless more often than not. And these are the strugglers. And the group is mainly your laterally compressed fish, right? Black. The butterflies, the candidontes, the tangs. And here's the hardy tags, like the yellow tang, and then there's the uh, infamous Achilles tag, which is one of those fish that we've all experienced, and you sold it to your client, and it's eating, and it's doing well, and they come down and, uh, for their coffee in the morning, it's just on its side, right? And more shy, don't say a thing. Uh, just, uh, it's a fish that's just definitely more challenging. Uh, the uh, the rabbit fish, uh, there's a large variety of rabbit fish, Probably the strongest out of this group. You agree to that? Rabbit fishes. They have to do really well. I love having a lot of rabbit fish in my shop uh, because we have 48, 75 gallon tanks we're trying to get spread out for green fish. So I have to use a lot of strong fish like rabbit fish and John the Cardinals and firefish to try to keep them all filled because I don't want a bunch of uh, fish that I'm just struggling and dipping and bathing all the time. I love these uh, box fishes because you can put them with anything. Little fish, big fish, triggers, angels, tanks, generally put them all over the place. The large angels, like the blue face angel, and then there's the small angels, like the central beach angels. It baffles me how many people always say, well, uh, I don't want to, you know, large angels are specialized fish, so we don't recommend those to uh, non beginners or beginners, but yeah, we'll sell you a coral beauty. Uh, it really baffles me. Uh, coral beauties and flame angels, I don't know about you, but I have clients that kill flame angels as much as they do reparatus. They die as well. They're not for beginners. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that, you know, they're just not beginner fish. And they certainly aren't reef fish, right? Flame angels can bond in things in reefs, so can coral beauties, or all these like bicolor angels, tempestins, they're all, they can be bad. You should always teach your staff to make sure that they fairly warn people to buy them to go in the reefs. Once they start at fleshy coral, they don't stop. I call this soup. Your systems with these types of fish should be skimmed. You should be using ozone and UV irradiation. These are very important components on a marine fish system that you want to have if you're going to keep these very specialized exotics. Because if you can do that, you'll be able to keep any type of high-end fish you may want. Uh, this is a fish that we keep quite often, and I don't even worry about it. I'll spend the money on it. I buy them, uh, you know, most of, some of you have been to my shop, some of you haven't, but anytime you come visit, you always find one of these there. Clarions, because I, I do these things by keeping skimming, good skimming. Skimming takes out all these dissolved organics. That keeps your bacterial viral count lower right there. Now if you UV your systems properly, think about that. You have a better or high sterilized system and lifting the redox, you're gonna improve the immune functions of the fish. You're just gonna have a stronger fish. Let's forget about all this medication the law. It's a stronger fish than we should have. My time is about up. I don't want to go over. Here's an example of a modern tank we had in the shop where it had lymph systems. You see it up on the fish? This is the same fish about two weeks later in our system. All of it was not medicated at all. Vitamin C pellets in a nice, well, UV sterilized system. That's all we did. You can achieve these things with the right systems of operation. I wish I had more time, but I am out of time. If anybody wants to ask me questions, I'm more than happy to talk to people outside the booth because they have to turn it around for the next group coming in. But I thank you so much for uh, letting me go through this a little quickly. I hope you got something out of it. Maybe you can take back your shops.